Greetings YouTubers, and welcome to episode 2 of my series, Lies Flurfs Tell. Today's episode is all about the Flurf claim that all plumb lines are parallel. This question was actually answered several centuries ago, during early attempts to precisely determine Earth's shape. So I'm going to start this video with a brief historical overview of that subject. In 1687, Isaac Newton published his magnum opus, Principia Mathematica. This publication inspired scientists to apply Newton's results and methods to as yet unanswered questions, one of which was the shape of the Earth. On one side, Newton and his adherents suggested that the Earth was an oblate spheroid, flattened at the poles. The alternative position was that the Earth was a prolate spheroid, flattened at the equator. This view was held by a family of French cartographers called the Cassinis, and none other than René Descartes. Working out which of these groups was correct came down to carefully analysing what we mean by a degree of latitude. In formal terms, a degree of latitude is the north-south distance one must travel to change the maximum altitude of a fixed celestial object by one degree. We normally think of one degree of latitude as corresponding to about 111 kilometres or 69 miles. But that's actually an average value, and it's not exactly correct. And in reality, the length of a degree of latitude will vary as you move north or south, and it was quickly realised that that variation could be used to answer this question. If Earth is prolate, then angles of altitude to celestial objects change most quickly at the poles, and more slowly at the equator, which is to say that degrees of latitude will be shorter at the poles and longer at the equator. If the Earth is oblate, on the other hand, the situation is exactly reversed. So to answer this question once and for all, the French Academy of Sciences decided to send out two expeditions. One, under the leadership of Anders Celsius, yes, that Celsius, and Pierre Maupertuis to Lapland, and a second under the leadership of Pierre Bouguet and Charles de la Condamine to what is now Ecuador. It is this second expedition, which was actually the first to depart in 1735, that we will be concentrating on. Formerly, the expedition was under the leadership of Louis Godin, but his main contribution seems to have been to spend most of the expedition's original funding in a Caribbean brothel. The worthwhile science that the expedition undertook was spearheaded by La Condamine and Bouguet. Godin's cousin, who was also on the expedition as a mapmaker, would marry a local woman called Isabelle. She would later become famous for slogging barefoot and alone through the Amazon basin to try and reunite with her husband, and her story is genuinely extraordinary and the subject of multiple books. I can't even begin to do her justice here, but please do read up on her. It's well worth the effort. But I digress. The expedition's plan was to map a transect from Quito in the north to Cuenca in the south, and meticulously triangulate this transect to determine the length of a degree of latitude. Rather optimistically, they initially estimated that this task would take about six months. But the ruggedness of the topography and the harshness of the climate meant that it ended up taking them ten years. While these delays were intensely frustrating, they gave the group time to consider other scientific problems. In particular, Bouguet was fascinated by a particular problem in surveying. There are two ways to determine the location of a given point on Earth's surface. One is to take careful angular observations of the elevation of celestial objects at particular times. And the second is to calculate the position of the target using surveying techniques. In an ideal world, these two techniques should give identical results, but in practice, they don't. Bouguet set up a site on Mount Chimborazo, and after careful analysis identified a deviation of seven arc seconds between the surveyed coordinates and the celestial coordinates of this site. He suggested that this deviation might be a result of gravitational attraction due to the mountain range and its influence on the plumb line that he had used to align his celestial observations. But he was far from certain about this and suggested that more observational evidence needed to be gathered. During the famous survey of the Mason-Dixon line several decades later, persistent discrepancies between the surveyed and the celestial coordinates were noted. But these discrepancies were not random, as would be expected for some sort of measurement noise. These were systematic. Henry Cavendish suggested that these discrepancies were due to the gravitational influence of the Allegheny Mountains on the plumb bobs and spirit levels used by the surveyors. 
It was this hypothesis that Neville Maskelin was intending to test when he proposed the Shahelian experiment. In this experiment, he was able to demonstrate that the discrepancy between the celestial and the surveyed coordinates acted in the opposite sense when the apparatus was moved to the other side of the mountain. The same phenomenon was observed during the great trigonometrical survey of the 19th century in which the British authorities surveyed India. In this case, the discrepancy between celestial and surveyed coordinates seemed to indicate that the plumb bobs were being deflected by the Himalayas. A sceptical observer might ask, why are we assuming that the celestial coordinates are wrong and the surveyed coordinates are right? Well, the simple answer is, we checked. In the Great Trigonometrical Survey, a baseline of known length was propagated using surveying techniques a distance of 600 kilometers, and the resulting error was less than 20 centimeters for a baseline more than 11 kilometers long. Modern instruments and techniques are vastly more accurate. So the discrepancies between surveyed and celestial coordinates are not produced by surveying errors. So the problem lies with the celestial coordinates, and in particular, the assumption that plumb lines are orthogonal to the reference surface. To illustrate this point more clearly, here is a schematic diagram. Objects accelerating under the influence of gravity move along the plumb line, which is normal to the gravitational equipotential surface. In general, objects do not fall towards Earth's geometric center. In other words, they do not fall normal to the reference ellipsoid. For the purposes of this diagram, I have hugely exaggerated the discrepancies between the plumb lines and the normals to the ellipsoid. In reality, these deviations are much smaller than shown here. I've just done it this way so that you can see what's going on. So we've known about deviations of the plumb line for nearly 300 years now. And this phenomenon is known in the surveying literature as deflection of the vertical, or vertical deflection. And observations of this phenomenon have been used to further our understanding of the geometry of Earth's gravitational field. We can further demonstrate that these deflections are due to gravitational effects by using gravimetric instruments to measure the gravitational field where these deflections are observed. The reality is that we don't need anything so sophisticated to demonstrate that plumb lines are not parallel. If plumb lines were parallel, then reciprocal zenith angles accurately measured between two survey monuments would always add up to 180 degrees. In reality, we observe that reciprocal zenith angles between widely separated monuments always add up to more than 180 degrees. This single observation simultaneously proves that plumb lines are not parallel, but also that Earth cannot be flat. Again, this is well understood in the surveying literature and widely applied. I'm including a handful of references here just to rub it in the faces of any flat earthers who have made it this far. But the reality is that any discussion of reciprocal zenith angles that I could provide would be pathetically shallow compared to the analyses that have already been done by Jesse Koslowski and Blue Marble Science. I'm pretty sure that anybody who's reached my channel is already aware of these two titans of the debunking field, but just in case, I've put some links in the description. So that might be about it for this discussion. In summary, in this video I showed that for more than 300 years we have been aware of gravitational deflection of plumb bobs. In surveying literature, this is known as vertical deflection or deflection of the vertical, and it has been studied meticulously. This alone is sufficient to demonstrate that the claim that all plumb lines are parallel is simply false. To this we can add the observation that accurately measured reciprocal zenith angles between widely separated monuments always add up to more than 180 degrees. Another reliable, repeatable, observational data set that directly contradicts the assertion that plumb lines are parallel. So the next time you hear a flat earther spewing this nonsense, you'll be in a position to demonstrate that they're talking out of their ass. Okay, so that's where I'm going to call it today. Thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate it, and I hope you'll join me next time when I'll be discussing the next flat earth lie, sea level is flat.